The general form with this view invites you to a free tour of Portugal. We travel 2000 kilometers across this country by car, visiting many interesting places and are ready to share our impressions. You will see formidable castles and majestic temples, steep mountain slopes and narrow streets. Throughout the course of the trip, to keep you entertained, we will tell you the legends of Portugal and go through the pages of its history, remembering that some of these stories were invented by court chroniclers. We will try to show the ties of historical events in Portugal with events in other countries, in order to better understand how they influenced the modern state of the country. We will begin our virtual tour from the north. After all, Portugal, first a county, then a kingdom, and now a republic, originated in the northern part of the current country. The northernmost city in Portugal is Braganza. From Lisbon, you need to drive 500 kilometers to get here. At the same time, it is only 20 kilometers from Spain to Braganza. Here is a road sign on the city street. We go to Braganza from the A4 highway, which leads from Porto to Spain, neatly bypassing the city. So many tourists, unfortunately, skip this wonderful place. When planning the route, we decided to examine Braganza from the hill above the river and then from there to head to the main attraction of the city, the castle, because it was very close to the hill on the map, just 500 meters. And from here you can catch the glimpse of the castle. Right on the hill there is a small chapel. And from above you can see the scientific center. Centro Ciencia Viva de Braganza. Why we strongly do not recommend using the route we have chosen, we will show you at the end of the video. But while we are going to this hill, we begin to overview the history of Portugal. In the territory where Braganza is now located, there was the Roman province of Galatia. After the fall of Rome, the territory of the future Portugal since 409 was ruled by the Germanic tribes of Vandals! By the way, you can find out why the name of this tribe has become derogatory and how much their reputation corresponds to the available facts by watching one of our films about Malta. Then another Germanic tribe of Suebi settled on the territory, which soon fell under the rule of Visigoths. Uh, note that all these tribes, including the Vandals, were Christians. From 711 to 716, Muslims, Arabs and Berbers gradually got to occupy almost the entire Iberian Peninsula. Only when they reached the northwestern part of it, they deemed it too cold and damp. The local people had no goods to plunder, and so let them do their thing. It was their strategic mistake that sent them to what was later called the Reconquista. On the territory not occupied by the Arabs, the small Christian kingdom of Asturias was formed. Its borders of that time were rather far away from the territory of modern Portugal. Asturias gradually expanded. On the maps of 910 you can see the settlement of Bragantz. The expansion took place without combat since the Arabs had left the inhospitable north by the late 8th century. These lands didn't have any rulers and were almost uninhabited. Vimara Parish, the illegitimate grandson of the Asturian king, crossed the Minya river and occupied the lands to the south. Here is a monument to him in the city of Porto. On the conquered lands, with the consent of King Alfonso III, a county was formed, ruled by Vimara. The county was named Candada de Portugale. From the name of this county, the word Portugal was subsequently formed. Growing Asturias was renamed the Kingdom of Leon, and on its map 
we can see both the country of Portugal and the settlement of Braganza. The head of this kingdom, Ferdinand, proclaimed himself the king of all Spain, but after his death his possessions were divided among his three sons into Galicia, Leon and Castile. By then, the descendants of Imar Parish had ruled the country of Portugal for over 200 years. The Count Nuno Mandes decided to take advantage of the situation and to make the country completely separate, but was killed in battle. And with no count, the county is no county. In the competition between the three sons of Ferdinand, the middle one was victorious. He became King Alfonso VI, nicknamed the Brave, as he continued their conquista and conquered Toledo. But the Spanish Muslims did not give up, and Alfonso called to the European knights to rally in a crusade through Spain. Few responded to the call. One of them was a descendant of Hugo Capet himself, Henry of Burgundy. Such a noble knight had to be made a count, and a countless county by the name of Portugal just happened to be lying around. As a result, Portugal received not only a count, but also a flag. You will say that this is the flag of Finland, and you will be right. But in 1093 Finland didn't exist yet, and Henry had just such a flag, and Portugal got it. To enforce control, Alfonso VI married Henry to his legitimate daughter, Teresa, but control turned out to be pathetic, and from the start Teresa declared herself queen. And then her son, Alfonso Enriquez, Enric's son, proclaimed himself king of the Portuguese, Rai dos Portugueses. In Spain, the king was also called Afonso, the seventh at the time. In 1143, he recognized Portugal as a kingdom. Afonso became the founder of the Burgundian dynasty. Braganza ended up in Portugal. In those days, cities were usually built on high hills near rivers. Here's the hill where the Braganza castle stands. And here is the Fervers River. Now this river has a dam and bridges. Via one of these bridges we crossed the river and had to ascend a steep bank. But the slope was as steep hundreds of years ago, being difficult for the enemies of Braganza to get to the castle. Having driven up the narrow street, we see the building of the church covered with the repair scaffolding. This is the church of St. Vicente. This is how it looks after or before the renovation. The building was completely rebuilt in the 17th century, the Romanesque style. Inside there is a rich interior with gilded wood. On the wall there is an image in blue and white tiling, azulejo style, depicting the citizens of Braganza being rallied to rebel against the French occupation in 1808. One of the most dramatic yet tragic events in the history of Portugal is associated with the Church of St. Vicente. At the same time, another Braganza temple, the Church of the Benedictine Monastery, believes that these events took place within its walls. And while we are driving from one church to another, we will tell you that in one of these temples there was a secret wedding of Don Pedro with Castro. <laughs> no, not with Fidel, but with Dona Inés de Castro. Pedro I, no, not the great, but the just, was the seventh king of Portugal from the Burgundian dynasty. But he was still an infante. That is, heir to the throne, Constance Manuel was brought to him as his bride. Earlier, she was planned to marry the Spanish king Afonso, the 11th at the time, but a better bride was found for him, and Constance was sent to Portugal. In the retinue of Constance, there was the maid of honor, Inés de Castro, and the Infante Pedro fell in love with her. Constance died in 1345, a week after the birth of Fernando who would eventually succeed Pedro on the throne. 
After that, Badger began to live openly with Inesh, and she gave birth to his four children. But the king of Portugal remained the father of Pedro, Afonso, the fourth at that time, and he ordered his son to find a bride among the princesses. Pedro secretly married Inesh against his father's orders. Afonso imprisoned Inesh in a monastery in Coimbra and then sent assassins there, who beheaded Inesh in front of one of her children. But Afonso soon died and Pedro became king. Legend has it that he gathered nobles in the palace and swore to them that he was married to Inês in Braganza. After that, her corpse was transported from Coimbra, dressed in royal robes, and placed on the throne. The courtiers were supposed to give Inês royal honors, and after that she was buried in the royal tomb. At the same time, there is no tangible evidence of these events. However, it is known that Pedro arranged two tombs in the cathedral of Alcobas for himself and Inesh, opposing each other in order to see his queen in front of the last judgment. A te o fim do mundo. He is engraved on the marble of the two tombs until the end of the world. Inês de Castro's story has inspired many pieces of art. There are 20 operas with the title Inês de Castro. Victor Hugo published the play Inês de Castro. Several films have also been made. But so far we reached the desired church of the Benedictine monastery. Now we turn to the right and soon through the stone gate we found ourselves in the territory of the castle. The castle has an oval layout, was built at the altitude of 700 meters above sea level and consists of a crenellated fortress wall with a perimeter of 660 meters reinforced with 15 towers. The walls have an average thickness of 2 meters and encircle the historic core of the city. Inside the walls there are now shops and cafes that try to recreate the atmosphere of a medieval city. In Roman times there was a small Fort Brigantia here, but then these places were empty for a long time. The castle Braganza is mentioned in documents from the 12th century. It was located near the border of Portugal and Leon Castile Spain. Therefore, during the wars between the states, the castle repeatedly passed from one hand to another and was gradually destroyed. This is what it looked like in 1510. From time to time, stones from the ruins of the castle were used as building material. During the wars with Napoleon, these stones were used to build barracks for the infantry battalion. In 1831, the castle was already uninhabited and continued to collapse. Here is a photo of the castle from the late 19th century. But in 1910, the castle was declared a national treasure, and it gradually began to be restored. The holes in the walls were repaired, the barracks of the 19th century were demolished, and the gates were recreated. In 1936, a military museum was created inside the castle. In the northern sector of the castle is the Dajon, that is, the main tower of the castle. It has a square layout and is 34 meters high. Slates were used during the construction, and the foundation was laid out of granite blocks. The fresh looking edges are composed of light limestone that is easy to work with. On the territory of the castle there is the Church of St. Mary, the oldest in Braganza. Domus Municipalis is also located here. This building was built in the 13th century. It contains a cistern for holding rainwater, and thus in the old documents it was called Zala de Agua. Meetings of noble people were also held here. The main gate of St. Anthony is protected on the sides by two towers and a barbican, a fortified gateway. Inside there are artillery sites. Here is a monument near the gate. The pedestal says it's Fernando. <laughs> 
No, not the hero of the song by ABBA, whose museum we visited in Stockholm, but the Duke of Bragance. But there were two Dukes of Bragance named Fernando, father and son. To whom of them is this monument? The problem was solved by searching for old photographs. This is the second Duke of Braganza, that is, the elder Fernando, about the founder of the dynasty, the first Duke of Braganza, whose name was, yes, once again Afonso, we tell in the film about Chavish, where a monument is erected to him. And Fernando standing in Braganza was one of the most important statesmen of his time. For example, he was the governor of Ceuta. That city is now owned by Spain. And we passed near Ceuta when we traveled through Morocco. But back in 1415, the city was taken away from the Arabs by the Portuguese, and they ruled it for 150 years. How Spain managed to appropriate Ceuta without a fight is a tale for another time. But the monument of Fernanda stands here because this duke in 1464 managed to have Braganza receive the status of a city and the corresponding privileges. In commemoration of the 500th anniversary of this event, a monument was erected. And now we show how we drove from the hill to the castle. Check your seatbelts for this one. It is good that we didn't choose a larger car. Yeah. So, are we passing on the right side? It passes, it passes, it passes. Somehow it all looks very Arabic. Can agree. Now the road here was 5 meters shorter than the road through the center, and the navigator chose it for some reason. Moreover, if we knew, of course, we would have changed the way there at the top, and then there is no to turn around. So, are we passing? Yeah, we have a pass. Are we already robbing mirrors? No? No, no, there is still space. Fine, enough space on the right. Instead, it is better to drive along wider, flatter streets, even if slightly longer. We left the castle through the eastern gate and moved on without any further troubles. When leaving Braganza, we see an unusual monument. This is a monument of migration to people who went to foreign lands in search of a better life. Migration has always been a typical human behavior, because it is boring to spend all your life in one place. Here we are, your guides, Tatiana Andreeva, Konstantin Krasovsky, and Leo Krasovsky, traveling to different countries and welcoming you to join us on virtual tours. If you enjoyed traveling with us, please smash the like button and share this video with your friends. In the meantime, we suggest you check out our tour to the heroic city of Shavish, referenced in many other places with streets called Defenders of Shavish or Heroes of Shavish. If you want to know which hero Shavish was defended from, and generally continue your journey through Portugal with us, subscribe to the Foreign Visitors View. See you in other cities and countries.